Hey guys, welcome to the Rate of Photosynthesis Lab. And today we are gonna investigate the components of photosynthesis, including the reactants and products. So, everything starts with light when it comes to photosynthesis. Everything has to happen in the presence of, of good light. old light. Um, then of course we input water and Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide obviously is a greenhouse gas. Plants take and absorb that. They are our great filters of the world. Yep. And so then you have photosynthesis happen, like you learned about in biology class, and you spit out good old C6H12O6, otherwise known as glucose. Sure. And of course, we have water and good old oxygen. <sighs> <sighs> All right, so it's time to start the lab. Mr. McCall, what's the purpose of this lab? Glad you asked. So essentially, we want to know what's the rate of photosynthesis, how much photosynthesis happens per unit time. And in order to do that, let's look at our lovely photosynthesis graphic here. We can look at the products of photosynthesis, which is glucose, water, and oxygen. We've already talked about that, right? But two of them, glucose and water, are a little tricky to try and measure with what we have with us. But oxygen, that I can do something about. If you look over here, we have what we call Elodia, which is a common freshwater plant uh, that you can find in most rivers and lakes and stuff. And what we're gonna do is we're going to snap its stem and we are going to measure the rate of bubbles, bubbles that come out of the stem. The faster the bubbles come out, the faster of a rate of photosynthesis we have going on, the slower the rate of bubbles that are coming out, the slower the rate of photosynthesis. So that is a way we can at least get a general measure of what's going on inside the plant. We're gonna use this lovely LED light as our light source today, and we're gonna set up this experiment. The first part of the experiment has to do with our setup. We're starting with a 200 milliliter beaker with about 125 milliliters of RO water, a 50 milliliter beaker with about 35 milliliters of RO water. And then we also have a gram of baking soda. Now this gram of baking soda is going to provide the CO2 needed for the reaction to take place. So we very carefully put the baking soda into the very narrow beaker. Stir it up a little bit. And we're going to take the Lodia and we need about, about a four centimeter segment. And I usually kind of pinch it like, a, like on a diagonal to get the maximum um, rate or the flow to be able to be provided through the stem. And we take off about a centimeter of leaves off of the plant. And we have this little piece of zip, twisty you know, tie. twisty tie, there we go, twisty tie to put at the bottom to use as sort of a weight to keep Highly the Elodia. sophisticated scientific weight. equipment. Clamp on. There you go. Okay, there we go. And, and then we're going to drop it into the beaker. And the reason why we have this segment separate, or this beaker separate from the 200 milliliter beaker, this setup right here, is it creates a water bath. Now, a water bath is usually used as a stabilizer and the reason why we're doing this is because we're going to have the beaker right next to the lamp and we don't want the heat from the lamp to um, influence the rate at all. So by having this insulation layer of water between the two beakers, that will give us our stabilization barrier. Because remember, back in the chemistry stuff we learned about, water has a high specific heat, so it takes a lot of energy to change the temperature. But the lower the volume, the more you're gonna be able to impact that. So that's why that works as a nice insulating container. So now that we have the Elodia loaded in the beaker, ready to go, let's talk about the rest of the experimental setup. So I did set up a ring stand with a thermometer involved, and I did this for a very specific reason. We want to make sure that we monitor the temperature of the water bath the Elodia is sitting in. Pretty much stays constant the whole time. Yeah. Because as you're designing experiments, for example, if you don't monitor and measure and data collect your constants, how do you really know they're constant? You don't. So you have to know that that is not influencing the actual experiment. 
So I've got that set up, and of course my light is set up on a stand right next to it. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it on. Hello. Oh, um, you're blinding me. I'm with blinding. Science. Yes. Uh, so then I have I have to measure the distance because we're gonna do different distances away from the light. That's how we're gonna control intensity. Um, and so. The zero end of the meter stick is here. It's going to butt up right against the light. And then it's going to go over here. We are going to do zero, 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50 centimeters away. So essentially, just to begin our first trial run, and uh, we're going to butt the meter stick right up against the light. And I'm going to move the Elodia right up to the zero mark. Otherwise, the edge of the table could come into problems and we will turn the light on. And so we always want to let it, let it sit in this position for about five minutes just to make sure that all of the different, the temperature, the light, everything, the Elodia uh, acclimates and it starts producing at a regular rate whatever it's going to produce bubble-wise. And then we're going to start counting it. And from there, we will count for about 10 minutes and count the number of bubbles that come out during that 10 minute period divide that by 10 and we'll get a per minute bubble count. Now I'll explain that a little bit in a minute. Then we'll go, this is the same trial, but at 10 centimeters, we'll do the same thing. We'll count for 10 minutes. Then we'll do 20 centimeters, 30 centimeters, 40 centimeters, and 50 centimeters. Therefore decreasing our level of light exposure. Exactly. Now. I'm going to do this 10 times. So there'll be 10 trials with measurements at each of these um, segments, length, uh, distances. But for our video, we want you to do some counting too. So what I've done is I've created a video of a one minute segment of the first trial from each of the different distances. So we are going to show that to you and you're going to count the number of bubbles per minute in that particular instance uh, for that trial. And I've even made it easier for you. I've actually sped up this film so that one minute is actually only a 30 second segment now. Um, so you're going to have to count those for the first trial and then we're going to provide you the numbers for the second, third, and fourth, and fifth trial. Here you can see a setup with the camera filming the first trial. And it's extremely bright, of course, but if we get a little closer, you can actually see the Elodia and they're all weighted out, pumping out bubbles. So now let's jump in and look at the close up and count. As you're counting, we're only counting the big bubbles that are coming out of the stem, not the little bubbles that are kind of coming from the surrounding. Now let's move to the second position 10 centimeters away from the light. Now we're at 20 centimeters away from the light. Our next station is 30 centimeters away from the light.
our temperature in the water bath is still about 25 degrees Celsius. Here we are at 40 centimeters away from the light. And now finally 50 centimeters away from the light. Now that you've gotten a chance to collect your own data for trial one, we're going to provide you with trial two, three, four, and five. You can thank us later. Now remember, trial one, we collected together in the video, and we actually collected it in strictly bubbles per minute. Here, trials two, three, four, and five, I actually counted bubbles for 10 minutes and divided by 10 to get the bubbles per minute that you see you only need to write down the bubbles per minute in your lab table. Now it is time for you to take the data that you've recorded into your lab tables and graph it. So pay attention to how you graph this because uh, you need to be able to learn what types of graphs fit what kind of scenarios and of course finish up your analysis questions. Remember your title and your labeling your axes as well. Yeah, a lot of people lose points over that. And of course, until next time, keep exploring. Keep learning.